welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to episode 42 of the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is writer, director, and filmmaker Bartek Podkova. Bartek is the managing director of Seven Hills Films, a London-based independent production company, who among the many other credits, captured the Southwark Playhouse productions of Wasted and Before After, created the live streams for the 2020 concert Signal Online with ALP Musicals, and On Hope, a digital song cycle for The Other Palace. Welcome, Bartek. Hi, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So you have a very interesting background in mechanical engineering. Can you share a little bit of that background for us? So I would say that more of my background is in maths and physics. I kind of managed to do a completely different thing, almost completely different thing, every year during my undergrad all the way through my master's. (laughs) So I originally did maths and the way... I need to go even further back. Originally, I wanted to do physics, but the way the course was structured, it actually made more sense to start with maths and do the physics module from natural sciences. So then uh, the plan from the beginning was maths year one, physics year two, which I did. And then I started changing the plan. Um, So in in my third year, I actually did history and philosophy of science because they wouldn't let me change to music, but they did let me let me not really change to that, but pick that as the module within natural sciences. So mechanical engineering didn't even happen until my master's. And did you start a PhD? Is that right? I started a PhD that was technically in engineering. In practice, it was a combination of engineering, computing, and biology because I was actually working on a computer model of a biological experiment. So it was, it was much more within those realms than engineering, I would say. But yeah, I started that, and then I joined the Film Society at my new university, and that was the beginning of the end of my studies. <laughs> so prior to going to college, was your interest always in maths and science and not in the arts or you mentioned music briefly there where does that fall into your passion and your your interests so my interest was definitely uh, in science the sciences music was a big part of my life for probably 10 years although i never really played professionally but i did play a lot <laughs> to the, to the point that my director of studies in my second year actually commented on uh, how well I could have done if I didn't spend so much time playing the guitar. So I I started playing, I think, either in junior high school or the beginning of high school. I I think it was halfway through junior high school, so when I was probably about 14. So I played uh, the guitar from that point on until, basically until I got into film. Because at that point, I didn't really have much time for anything else. And that was uh, pretty much the only really artistic thing that uh, I did until I got into film. But I did, I think, at some point write two chapters of a book. And that that was about it. Oh, very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) I'm very curious, uh, we were talking before we started recording that you grew up in Poland, Mm -hmm. and what kind of uh, theater programming or music program is available to students in Poland? Theater programming? I wouldn't know, because other than uh, what we did within the school setting, I didn't really go to theater much. I I was, uh, even before I started working in film, I was definitely much more interested in film. So, yeah, so I wouldn't know. In terms of music, there are a lot of festivals. There are festivals in my hometown. There are are lots of really random 
things happening in Poland musically. Like, I remember at some point there was some kind of uh, drumming camp, I think, but it wasn't like on a drum kit. It was some traditional drums or something like that. Uh, There is this place uh, that I never went to, but uh, my cousin, who actually uh, also plays the guitar and ended up studying music and uh, now plays professionally, he uh, he went to this place that I've heard about before that kind of an old sheep farm that got transformed into this kind of workshop slash performance space. Love so th- th- there's a lot of really <laughs> random stuff happening. I mean, my hometown, Lublin, is a university city. There are, I think, maybe seven or so universities. I, I, would, I would have to count. And because of that, uh, there is a lot happening there artistically. And so fast forward back to university and joining mm-hmm. the Film Society. What sparked for you? What what made you even join the Film Society? So several things happened at the same time. One was I actually started my PhD at King's, but then about two or three years in, I moved to UCL together with my supervisor because basically the uh, department was shutting down. So he moved, and because I still had a fair bit uh, to do, I moved, uh, and I started looking at, well, what's happening at UCL that's interesting. And the Film Society was one of those things, and that was actually the year when it sort of relaunched. Uh, so I think the Film Society did, at UCL did a fair bit in the 90s. Then there was a period when it died down a little bit. It was still around, but it wasn't that visible. And literally, I think two months after I came to UCL, there was essentially a big relaunch. Uh, and it's been very active since then. So that was kind of the second thing. And the third thing was that I wanted to watch a movie a very particular movie, and then I, didn't, then I realized that it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> so I started writing it. I wrote it. Uh, I, I later made a short version of what I wrote, kind of getting rid of all the really, really expensive scenes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was kind of it. Well, I want to watch it. It doesn't exist. Well, let's make it. What was the film about? So it, it, it was basically something... Uh, within the style, or at least a similar setting, to what uh, H.P. Lovecraft uh, did. So his kind of style of horror, but in a modern setting. And that that's actually uh, something that has been, since then, explored more. There was a really, really good TV show. I think they've only done one season, Lovecraft Country. Uh, which oh, is actually so based fantastic. on a book. Yeah, so you, you've yeah. seen it, so you know what I'm talking I, yeah. about. So that was kind of a similar thing, although mine was more in the thriller direction. So it's kind of uh, David Fincher's Seven uh, combined with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. That that kind of thing. Oh, very interesting. Uh, I I might actually re- rewrite it at some point because that was the very first screenplay. Uh, that I've ever written, so obviously it wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't want to write it properly at some point. Yeah, so that's on my to-do list. Excellent. We we always have an ever-growing to-do list. People yes. who create and, and have uh, big visions always have a long to-do list. <laughs> Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> We're never bored. One of those double-edged swords. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, what led you from working with the Film Society and and making your own work to working with Seven Hills Films and coming to film theater projects? Well, Seven Hills Films was always kind of an umbrella thing for everything that I do. Um, So I originally created it for my short films. Uh, So... uh, the reasons for it existing and how it functions and so on uh, are kind of constantly changing. <laughs> so it's it, it, kind of the, the best way to look at it is that uh, it, it covers ev- everything that I do, everything that uh, I'm heavily involved in, uh, in somewhat of a leading role. 
Um, and uh, or originally uh, within that, uh, I was focusing on my short films, but uh, then I started uh, producing a la later, directing some music videos. And the ones that I was producing usually didn't fall under that umbrella because it was kind of done in collaboration with someone else who already had a production company and that was kind of a bigger thing. Uh, but the ones that I directed were certainly a part of that. Uh, and because of those music videos, someone uh, then asked me, hey, can you film my show? And then I was asked to film another and another and another. And uh, that's kind of how it goes. And Kind of that's, I guess, how it worked with most of these things because it was similar uh, with live streams. So, so someone asked me to do a very simple live stream and I haven't done any live streams before. So I learned how to live stream. And uh, yeah, so that was a few years before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic started, uh, I think there was like a period of six weeks when I didn't really have any work or at least there, there wasn't much. And I literally just sat down and learned everything I could about uh, live streaming and about kind of doing things like bringing remote guests in and so on. And it it's a lot easier to do now than it was two years ago in many ways, because there are actually a lot of tools that just either got developed over the last two years or just became more polished or popular yeah became and became more readily available too yeah 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 how did the connection okay before i get to that mm -hmm. i'm curious what you see as the differences between filming a short film and filming a theater production and we can talk about filming a theater production either for archive or for streaming, mm -hmm. like for release later or live streaming a theater production, because I know those are also two separate things. So to start off with, what is the difference between filming a music video or a short film and filming a theater production? So the biggest difference uh, in my experience, and it's a, a little bit different when you get to a very high level where you have the budget to do certain things. The biggest difference <laughs> is that when you're making a short film or a music video, with very few exceptions, uh, you have a very good sense of what you will be filming and how before you even start the day. Uh, with theater, the ideal situation would be uh, you get the entire script, you get to watch the rehearsal, maybe you film that with a single camera, then you discuss everything with the director, figure out if, let's say, well, you have to do it with three cameras and you only have one camera doing a close-up, who do you follow in a particular scene? Um, that doesn't really happen because all of that translates to more time and uh, more time translates to more money. Uh, so for me, in practical terms, that has been the biggest difference. Um, so pretty much every time I film a show, I have to think on my feet. So there are certain things that uh, you will discuss with the director in advance, because if... So something uh, that I do very commonly is a three camera setup. So uh, typically, can you talk us through what that looks like? Where where the yeah. cameras are positioned and yeah, go that for it. that was exactly what I was about to do. <laughs> uh, so normally, one camera will do a wide shot, and I'm uh, there are exceptions to that, but let's face it, the vast majority of theater shows have kind of the same overall geographical layout. There are very few instances where the audience is all the way around or stuff like that. Uh, so normally one camera will do uh, the wide shot. So it will literally see the entire stage and everything that the director might want to catch. So for example, recently uh, for The Wicker Husband, I knew that I also had to catch uh, the musicians on the sides, who weren't really that illuminated. They weren't really the focus of it for the most part, but in a few scenes, they did actually interact with the rest of the cast, so it was important to have them in that wide shot as well. 
So that's usually one camera, and if you film a show with just a single camera, that will be it, because mm. uh, you want to see the whole thing. Then when you add a second camera, uh, that will uh, usually be operated, uh, which means that it has to sit on a slightly better tripod, which will be slightly smoother, and I have to actually pan it and tilt it and uh, zoom, uh, and obviously focus. Um, <laughs> so that will usually, uh, depending on the room and depending on the show, it will usually cover mid-shots, uh, so kind of from uh, the waist or kind of mid-chest up. Uh, it could go all the way into a close-up, could go all the way back to almost a full shot. It depends on the room, the distances, uh, and so on. Mm. Then when you add a third camera, uh, then things get a little bit more complicated uh, because you have more options. Um, and uh, typically, uh, if you don't have a second operator, you will get something that falls in between the wide shot and uh, the close-up in terms of the shot size, uh, so that it all cuts nicely together. And then in terms of the position, so the previous two usually would be front-on, uh, so that, well, obviously in the wide shot you want kind of a nice symmetrical view of the stage. In the close-up you want to be equally able to look left and look right. Uh, with the third camera it varies, Sometimes it has to be right next to those other two because once the audience comes in, there is no way you can leave, so there is no way you can monitor that camera, uh, there is no way you can do anything if, uh, if something goes wrong. If there is no audience, or if you've got uh, another operator, then you can put that uh, third camera at more of an angle, uh, which with a lot of shows can make a lot of a difference. With some shows it can be tricky. There is a lot of kind of figuring out uh, where people are the most likely to stand over two hours and stuff like that. Um, so if, if this is actually a, going back to what you asked earlier about the difference between a music video and uh, a music video or a short film and a stage show. Typically in a stage show, if you're shooting it all the way through, uh, you won't really get a chance to reposition a camera. Whereas in a in a short film, you will not just reposition every scene, you will reposition for every shot. And most of the time, uh, a short film will be shot with a single camera. Uh, same with a music video. Uh, so you do often have to compromise in theater. Uh, partly because you can't reposition, partly because uh, for some reason, theaters tend to have audiences in. And they just get in the way. <laughs> They really get in the way. <laughs> you can see where I come from a film background and not a theater background. It's funny, given that my entire site is dedicated to shows filmed with an audience. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, audiences are tricky because they definitely add to the show. And obviously actors are used to performing for an audience and very often they kind of feed from that feedback that the audience is giving them mm. but from the point of view of someone filming the whole thing it's like oh my god they set someone really really tall right in front of me <laughs> and i have to avoid them for the next two hours we could just get rid of them and then add the applause in post <laughs> <laughs> when you're filming a live show with the audience in place do you have to change the lighting or the sound or ask the actors to adjust any of their what they're doing on stage to accommodate the cameras? No. So uh, that's the short answer. The long answer is <laughs> lighting. In the ideal world, you would change the lighting a little bit for the cameras because uh, lighting in theater tends to go from one extreme to another. And it obviously depends on the show, but the space within uh, which theater lighting lives is very, very, very big, uh, which is very challenging uh, for cameras. And uh, even maybe 10 years ago, maybe, maybe even seven years ago, if you wanted to capture a theater show, 
with multiple cameras, uh, you would have to get really expensive cameras because otherwise you would have to constantly change the settings depending on the scene because, oh, that scene is very bright and this one's very dark and this one's really purple. Uh, and the cameras who were able to uh, capture uh, those variations were pretty damn expensive. Right now, they are much, much cheaper. Uh, well, or rather, right now, there are cameras that slot in between uh, those kind of, uh, consumer cameras and professional cameras, frequently called prosumer cameras. Um, and it's I'm, I'm doing them a bit of a, disser a disservice by calling them that, because they are fully-fledged professional cameras, but they're closer in price to consumer cameras. And they can capture a lot of those variations. You still have to be very careful because uh, spotlights are ridiculously bright. And if you have a dark scene and uh, in a show and then you have a scene with a very strong spotlight, you need to really, really check your settings before the show to make sure that you capture it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then it's uh, tricky. I, this might be going down a technical rabbit hole, but oh, what, what those. are those cameras? What what kind of, like, can you give us names of like yeah, what sure. kind of cameras ideally capture a theater performance? So from my point of view, and obviously there might be people who disagree and uh, prefer <laughs> other tools, uh, the Blackmagic Design Pocket Cinema camera line is great because uh, they are relatively cheap. Um, and they do something that, especially with shows that have very complex lighting, uh, is very, very beneficial, which is they uh, can record raw. What that means is uh, if you've ever used a camera, you've probably at least seen things like white balance and ISO. So white balance essentially tells the camera what is actually white because that is not clearly defined. White is kind of an entire range uh, that changes with lighting. E even if something's lit by the sun, uh, the white balance changes depending on the time of the day and whether it's cloudy or not. Uh, like our, our brains do a lot of work uh, in terms of adjusting the image that cameras normally don't, or if, if we try to make cameras do that, the whole thing just falls apart. Um, so uh, nor normally, uh, if you don't record raw, that setting is burnt into the file, which means that if you go from a scene that's lit with very warm lights to a scene that's uh, lit with very cold lights, if you set for one, then the other will just go way, way further than you want it to go. If you set in the middle, neither will really look that great. Mm -hmm. um, so filming in RAW allows you to actually adjust that later. So you can fine-tune things in post without losing quality. And you can fine-tune things without shooting RAW, uh, but this gives you a lot more leeway. So that's... So how uh, does that work mm -hmm. when, when you're live streaming a show? How is, how is that editing working? You can't do that, but uh -huh. th there is another element... That also has to do with color. Uh, there is uh, this thing called the color gamut. Basically, imagine all the different colors that the human eye can see. And if, if you look up the chromaticity, the chromaticity diagram, it will literally show you kind of like this slightly rounded triangle that contains all, all the different colors that you can see. Um, most of the content that we watch online or on the TV uh, has a much, much smaller color gamut. So the, the possible colors that you see uh, on your screen are just a small subset of what your eye can potentially see. And uh, most of the content use, uh, uh, that we consume uses Rec. 709, which is now getting a bit outdated because it goes back to the 90s. Um, but like most of what you will watch in terms of recorded theater has to confirm to that. So this is uh, part of basically standard dynamic range, although dynamic range is 
a different thing than color gamut. There are a lot of interconnected <laughs> terms that I don't want to get into right now. But basically, <laughs> like I said, technical rabbit yeah, hole. <laughs> standard dynamic range is associated with, with Rec 709, which is a small triangle within that huge range of colors. And now HDR is getting more and more popular. There are more devices capable of displaying HDR and recording, like a lot of phones can record HDR. And that actually has a larger color gamut. So the whole thing about HDR isn't just that it can capture a wider range of dark to bright, which obviously is very important in theater, but can also capture a wider range of colors. Uh, So uh, obviously, since you can display all of those things on diagrams, you can also create transformations between them because you basically create a matrix to go from what number corresponds to what other number between those two different triangles. So that means that if you capture something in a wider color gamut, you can still compress it to a smaller one. So how it's relevant to theater is that theater can be very, very colorful. So the more of that color you can capture, the better you can then represent it, whether you are recording it or not. Because uh, mm-hmm. even if you're live streaming it and not recording for later use, uh, and obviously you're sending out that signal in that small Rec. 709 space, you still have more control over how you go from that super, super wide space of all the potential colors into the smaller space of what you can display on a monitor. And you can, to a degree, even customize it. So uh, let me actually... Actually, no. I, I won't show you because it won't go into the podcast anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll explain it. So uh, there is uh, this method of capturing the image, uh, which is called log. Uh, So what it means is that the image captured in the camera is actually very low contrast and very desaturated. And that's because it's captured in a way that gathers as much data as possible, as opposed to what looks nice to your eyes. And uh, if, for example, uh, the camera has an HDMI output, you could then say, well, okay, take that image and then apply this specific transformation to it so that it actually looks nice to whoever's watching it. And that could be a client watching something on a monitor during a commercial shoot, or it could be an audience at home watching a theater show. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that transform, you can either use the default one that comes with a camera, and there are often several that come with a camera. You can download one off the internet, or... If there is the budget for it, if there is a time, if a time for it, you could actually record several clips from a show during the rehearsals when the lighting is uh, finalized and so on. Take it into the computer and actually create a custom transform that you then put back in the camera. Hmm. So... Uh, I've never done that in practice in a live setting. I've done it in post-production. And sometimes clients get weird questions like, hmm, do you you think I made it a little bit too pink? And they're like, no, no, it's (laughs) fine. But it's just like a tiny bit too pink. Uh, But (laughs) you you can actually uh, do a lot. I I don't know if anyone has uh, used this in a live setting, but it's absolutely doable and it's not even that complicated. Uh, so you could create, so if these transforms are called lookup tables, uh, you could create a lookup table that uh, is, for example, very, very desaturated, but not quite black and white, and very, very contrasty, because maybe your show is kind of based in the world of old detective novels, but you don't want to go quite black and white, but you want to kind of get a bit of that feel. You, you could absolutely do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's like, that's very exciting. There's lots of like potential there. There is a lot of stuff that I think is very rarely done. And I don't want to say if it's never done because uh, it's not like I've seen every show that's been live streamed ever. But uh, I think most of the time, 
uh, shows are streamed in a very basic way. Sometimes, if someone has a lot of money, uh, they're filmed in a much more deliberate way, like Hamilton, mm -hmm. where they have lots of time to prep, lots of time to plan, to discuss everything. Where exactly will this person stand? Okay, then the camera six needs to be exactly here and focus needs to be here. They, they have the money and the time to do that. But I think there are a and lot of things. They have jibs that... and cranes yeah, yeah, and exactly. like things that move. <laughs> uh, but very often what happens is, okay, so we have these three seats blocked off for you and you need to squeeze in here. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and it's understandable because, uh, I mean, time is money. Uh, and uh, there's only so much money in in the budget for uh, recording a show. What do you think makes a good capture? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Your best answer in less than a... No. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, actually, I would say the most important thing is the same as the most important thing in film, which is sound. Hmm. Um, so, uh, in general, people will put up with bad video a lot more easily than with bad audio. Um, so, uh, ideally, uh, you would have every, every single actor and every single instrument mic'd up, you would capture all of these feeds in, individually, and then someone would actually spend the time on mixing that. Again, in practice, that doesn't always happen, because that can be a really big job. I've read, and what I understand is that a lot of uh, pro shots, the sound is coming from the soundboard, where it is being yes. mixed live. Um, so you just plug into the soundboard and so capture that's, that audio. Uh, it's not always the case, but that's usually what I try to get is that. But then uh, what can also be very useful uh, is uh, just capturing the room sound, just putting two microphones in there, attaching them somewhere and capturing that. And sometimes uh, the person doing sound for the show can accommodate that they they might say yeah we we have two spare mics we can put them up there i can record that along with everything else and that's great because uh if you're if you're filming a show with an audience you want to hear the audience at least when they're applauding not necessarily when they're coughing and drinking so something drinking. which does happen <laughs> uh, uh, so ideally you would have an audience mic and capture that in addition to what you would consider as the sound of the show you can call it the audience mic or the room mic it kind of de depends on the context uh, there are shows where uh, it's uh, impossible for one reason or another to plug into the desk maybe it's a very small show that uses a very small desk and literally all the outputs are being used or the sound designer set up the desk and they're now on another job and no one else in the room actually knows what goes where on that desk you don't want to touch that an hour before the show. Don't mess with it. <laughs> yeah. So, so sometimes the solution is just to have those two room mics set up. Mm -hmm. And you can still get decent sound with that. Uh, usually when I do that, I do spend some time uh, cleaning the sound up. It's uh, actually, in, in many ways, it is similar to video in that the dynamic range is really, really wide. Because especially if it's a small room, you can have an actor almost whispering and then another actor shouting right after that. So that needs to be uh, brought up and brought down so that the relative levels are not that off. And that's actually something that uh, if I'm live streaming a show, I'm doing that on the fly uh, in a slightly more crude way, but uh, still it works. So every time I live stream, uh, and not just a show, but anything, I compress the audio, uh, so basically any sound above a certain level gets brought down by a certain factor, uh, and that ensures good listening experience, because uh, let's face it, most people watching a theater show at home 
will watch it on a laptop, or even if they watch it on a TV, uh, they will not have a great sound system, and sometimes they will just watch it on their phone. And that's fine, but you kind of have to anticipate that, and you have to ensure that they don't have to constantly change volume. Uh, what a challenge for people, you know, creating, even just creating film, and but mm. capturing theater, keeping in mind all these different ways that people now consume content. Mm. It's not just going out to, you know, a however many inch television screen like everyone had the same size or a cinema screen like there's so many variations now there's ipads and uh, mm -hmm. iphones and there's there's so many different ways we can consume content on different size screens and like you say different kind of sound systems whether it's earbuds or a tinny little iphone speaker um so that's that's a really interesting challenge to be able to accommodate everything from cinema through to your little iphone mm. i mean it's and something that's constantly evolving, because obviously our TVs have changed a lot, even in the last 10 years, uh, let alone 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same goes for the sound. Um, I mean, earbuds are getting better and better. I still hate Bluetooth. I, I do use it, but I just hate it. So hopefully that will get replaced soon by something else. I mean, in, in terms of TVs, it, actually something that I was thinking about earlier today uh, was Dolby Vision. So uh, that's kind of, an, it's not exactly the next step beyond HDR. It's just a better implementation of HDR, uh, except uh, in very simple implementations of HDR, uh, you basically just go, well, I can go way darker and way brighter and have way more colors and will still look all right. Uh, with Dolby Vision, uh, the, the video file actually contains uh, metadata for specific scenes that tells the, uh, the device how it should be displayed. Um, and uh, if we could have everything in Dolby Vision, that would look amazing. I think a lot of Netflix stuff is Dolby Vision now. Disney Plus definitely does that. And uh, if your TV supports it, it will look great. Every time I had to switch from Dolby Vision to regular HDR, there was a decrease in quality, some weird tints here and there. Uh, but obviously that also that translates to having to have a TV that supports it, which you can get, like, my TV definitely falls within the budget range uh, for what it is and has Dolby Vision. But then you actually have to color the show with Dolby Vision in mind. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot more work uh, on that end. I'm curious, I, I don't wanna to go too far into this next topic, but I, I do wanna ask you about it. What you think the capabilities of virtual reality are in terms of, I don't know if you have any experience with that, but what virtual reality and uh, streaming and live theater, how they might all come together? So I think that's something that definitely will happen and we're not too far off. I'm just not sure whether we're quite there yet. Uh, mm. Obviously, there is a bit of a VR boom now and uh, there are a lot more viable products than there were a few years ago. They're a lot more affordable. I, I remember uh, the previous VR boom in the 90s, which did not go that well simply because the equipment was really uncomfortable. Everything was just way bigger, way heavier. Heavy. The quality wasn't there. I don't know whether we're at a point where it's here to stay in this form yet, or if it will die down a little bit and then 15 years down the line will finally be there. Um, we'll see, but it, it will definitely happen. It shows like that will definitely happen and maybe there will be elements of audience participation and so on uh, yeah and, and it, it does open a lot more possibilities and i mean it doesn't even have to require audience participation maybe someone will literally create a virtual theater so that you can retain that theater experience in terms of sitting down with, with an audience and actually feeling like you're looking at a stage and not at a screen um but yeah, we'll, we'll see. Happening. I mean, yeah. well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of... becoming starting mm -hmm. to exist. 
Yeah. There's a lot of technology that's uh, opening a lot of possibilities. Like uh, in film, for example, there's the volume. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it. Mm-mm. So basically, they they've used it on uh, the Mandalorian, so the Disney Plus Star Wars show. Uh, I think they used it on the new Batman as well. Uh, imagine a really really advanced LED screen that you put behind your actors, but instead of showing a pre rendered video, that screen, the image on that screen, is being dynamically generated by a computer and is changing depending on what you need uh, but also depending on where you point the cameras mm. so because is of that, that it what looks the RSC did with um mid they did it like a midsummer a virtual reality immersive and you could watch it on a regular screen mm. i'm not sure if that was the technology they i don't using. know i don't know i would have to check uh, but basically allows much greater realism and it's those screens are big enough and bright enough that they're actually lighting your actors. Mm. So a big problem that uh, we had for a long time with green screen was that uh, you essentially had to match the lighting on your actor with the lighting that you might create for the background in post later on. And that can be very tricky. With this... Uh, the lighting is realistic because it's coming from that screen from the specific scene. So if you have the sun in your scene, you have a fake sun effectively light- lighting your talent. So uh, perhaps uh, that will get implemented in some way as well. I mean, uh, we're definitely living in a very interesting time, technologically speaking. Yeah. Oh, it's so exciting because things are changing so rapidly. And like you said earlier, becoming available. Mm-hmm more than ever before it's yeah. it's not just the, the the few that can access this technology mm-hmm. it's like pretty much everyone can have a camera in their pocket yeah. now which is quite extraordinary someone can literally write a one person play and perform it on tiktok if they want to yeah and then you can win a grammy with <laughs> look at uh um bridgerton the musical mm. produced entirely on tiktok and instagram and uh has now won a grammy um so yeah the the possibilities are very exciting it's going to change mm. uh the gatekeepers are not the traditional gatekeepers are no, yeah. are no longer going to we'll be. get new gatekeepers okay. it's fine <laughs> <laughs> i want to touch on a couple of the shows that you have filmed mm-hmm. um first of all i would love to talk about wasted which was one mm-hmm. of my favorite streams of 2020 but it was filmed in 2018 at southwark playhouse can you tell us a little bit about that setup and first question though was it um filmed for archival purposes was the intention to release that film i think it was for archival purposes i don't think we were really thinking about streaming it at that point um that was a long long time ago those five camera <laughs> yes. shoot. in the before times <laughs> yes in the olden days <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a five camera shoot, although one of the cameras was a GoPro. I, I don't think we used it much in the final edit. I think there are like two or three moments. Um, yeah. Uh, Do you remember well, the thinking behind, like, why, why use a five camera? set up for an archival why not just do a camera up the back of the theater i, I know it was in the mm-hmm. round but why why not just stick a camera up the back and have it that for for an archive why why do a five camera shoot so i would say two primary reasons one if you're capturing a wide shot you never really get to see the actors faces that well and you could argue that, well, if, if you're sitting in a theater, unless you're really, really close to the stage, you also don't get to see the actors' faces. Uh, but I don't think that filming shows should be just about capturing what happened, uh, but also about adding to it. Uh, and whether we're talking about being able to zoom in on, zoom in on someone's face or... Uh, editing and i mean rhythm is a huge part of editing and that can really influence uh, the viewing experience uh, 
so obviously the more cameras you have, the more options you have in terms of the editing rhythm, in terms of what you want the audience to focus on. Uh, but with a show like Wasted, where the square was stage and kind of each of the actors had their own corner, I mean, technically there was the back of the stage where the band was and so on, but at the same time, the action can happen in so many different directions that you really want to capture something like that from as many different directions as possible. Because uh, otherwise, someone might have a very important line or a very a very important reaction without any uh, dialogue while their back is to, uh, to the camera. And you, you mentioned editing, and I love the idea of the rhythm mm. of the show being captured through editing. Are you heavily involved in the editing process and, and what happens in that process? Yes. So I edit all the shows myself. Uh, editing is kind of tricky, especially with musicals. And not necessarily tricky in a bad way. It's just that, especially when you have three, four or five cameras, you have a lot of options. Sometimes those options are obvious. Let's say someone's uh, back is to the camera in all angles except for one, and they're singing. Well, you'll pick the camera that's on them. Uh, but sometimes all three cameras see them, and the question is, which one do you go with? And uh, that could be, for example, a question of, well, are they in a verse or in a chorus? What's the energy of the song like? Uh, is there anything happening around them that's important? Or is someone doing something that's really in preparation from the for the next scene, but it's not really that important? Um, so uh, there is a matter of what you show, but there is also a matter of when you cut. And you can cut in so many different ways, because uh, kind of w one of the most basic ways of cutting just in terms of how you get from one shot to another in film is you cut on movement. Uh, because that, in a way, smooths out the transition. Because uh, if you think about it, a cut, uh, especially if you go from one static image to another, is it, it, it's very strong. It's a very, very uh, big statement that you make with the editing. But then if someone's moving while that's happening, that smooths it out. And you might want that, but maybe you actually do want to emphasize it. So it's it depends on the moment. It depends on the song. It depends on whether you want the cuts to feel hidden or whether you want them to emphasize something. Maybe you have uh, a few hits on a big drum in a row and you want to time your cuts with that to emphasize that even more. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, you can't go by feel very often. And then you send it in and the director might have a completely different idea. <laughs> uh, which is, yeah, like that's kind of a thing that I've noticed. Sometimes I think that it should be cut in a very, very specific way. But then I'm paying attention to something completely different than the director is paying attention to. Um, so there isn't only one way to cut uh, things. Oh, I desperately want to get into an editing room now and watch that process. <laughs> it's <laughs> a very it slow so process. <laughs> and it's something I, I think audiences are, are interested in too. I would love more access to multi-camera views of a show and being able to choose as an audience member what I'm watching. Choose your I, own I adventure. Love <laughs> that, yeah, kind of. I, I think there's something really interesting about that. And then like adding in for theater elements of like, uh, and previous guests have talked about talked about this. Could we have a camera on the stage manager and like be able to <laughs> tune into their feed? And what is it like to be a customer? And what is it like to be the lighting person? Like, there are so many aspects mm -hmm. of theater. It's not just the performers on stage. There are, and with the technology that we have now, that it's possible to tap into all these different elements of the theater. I think mm -hmm. that's that's something that I would love personally. I feel like you're <laughs> kind of loves behind the scenes. talking about an almost director's commentary approach to a theater show 
where you yes. get <laughs> the show and then all the behind the scenes stuff that are happening. Oh, I'm totally a child of the 90s. Give me my <laughs> DVD box set with my director's commentary and my behind the scenes footage, <laughs> bonus footage. I miss those days. We, <laughs> I think the transition to digital and online, we've, mm. we've lost a lot of that. It's, hard. Yeah, it's That content yeah. is less available. Yeah, I, I know that Disney Plus is doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Like they uh, release many documentaries. Uh, I think like they have many docs about specific marvel characters that are released uh, in time with various series and movies and so on uh but i don't think netflix has but i think they they have a few things that are behind the scenes uh but they don't really do it that regularly it's not a standard anymore yeah like yeah. i remember when you could you know every dvd had that and yeah. now i mean every dvd you know. i had a completely separate dvd for star wars <laughs> right, like a special release. I think that that may have been more than one DVD. I can't remember, but there was a lot of data in there, and they put a lot of work into it. It's called uh, "Behind the Magic," I think. Oh right, yep, yep, yep. Love, I love. Let's. I love delving into behind the scenes. <laughs> oh, this is so fantastic. So uh, our final section here is called "My Favorite Things," and I will be asking you a series of questions. Uh, you don't have to think about them too much. There is no <laughs> correct answer, no right or wrong answer. To start off with, do you have a favorite musical? Can I cheat a little bit on account of, of me course. being primarily a film person? You and I go indeed. with a musical film, not necessarily a film musical, <laughs> but a film that uses music heavily. Sure. Hey, so I, I have two, and I'll be judged for both of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> One is Pitch Perfect, which is literally a movie, that I, the only movie that I've seen more times than Star Wars. Okay, I am so amused, and I, I love you for it. <laughs> Aka what? <laughs> uh, and then the other one is Purple Rain. Uh, Prince? Yep. Which is a movie that should not have worked, but somehow it did. I think there, there are only two professional it. actors in that film. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're allowed to be biased for this question. Do you have a favorite filmed live musical? <sighs> As in a filmed stage version of a musical. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like Hamilton is a cop out, <laughs> but they did it so well. They did do it so well. It's a beautiful capture. And it, it's an interesting hybrid of filmed live with an audience mm -hmm. and then all the you know we were talking about earlier take having the money to yep have extra days of shooting where you're on the stage with cameras and yeah so it's a beautiful hybrid of of film and live theater speaking of a filmed live musical it's not exactly a film and it's not exactly theater so what should we call it <laughs> you won't like my answer <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my answer is I don't actually care because uh, from my point of view, it's not a. From my point of view, it's a continuum. There are a lot of things that exist between a pure stage show performed only ever on a stage, only ever seen by the people in that room, and uh, a movie that was shot over two months, and then the editing process took half a year. There's a whole spectrum in between that. For example, uh, there is a really, really good new movie called Boiling Point. If you haven't seen it, watch it. And it's it, it was filmed in a single shot. They did four takes over uh, two days, and they used the third take. Uh, it's uh, It basically follows a head chef of a restaurant... Uh, on a very, very intense day. Uh, it follows him. Occasionally it diverts to the other characters, either other employees uh, of the restaurant or some of the people coming in. It's primarily focused on the employees. Uh, so it's, it's very clearly a movie. It was 
always always designed as a movie, but at the same time, it's happening in real time, and there there is a lot about it that makes it feel like a play. Hmm. So that that's why I'm, I'm kind of. I mean, there is the term digital theater, but I don't think that fully represents the whole spectrum of things. I, I, I think we, we need to start thinking more in terms of this is the story that I want to tell and this is how I'm interested in telling it and these are the tools that I have rather than labeling things, which I guess, again, is a cop-out, but no, I, I, really, I do feel I like it's more that answer. Now I want to create a visual of what is the spectrum of theater to film. I, th- I think that's a really great idea. Yeah. There's your science brain coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to label everything. And then if I can't label it in a binary way, I have to create a continuum. I, that's perfect. I love that. Where do you stand on bootlegs? So I don't actually have much experience with theater bootlegs, but... I do have a lot of experience with music bootlegs. Hmm. Um, I think it depends. So, kind of, I feel like we do have a bit of a problem in that consumer cameras and phone cameras have gotten pretty damn good, which means that a bootleg that you create now can actually look pretty decent. Uh, versus a bootleg created in the 90s where only diehard fans would watch that uh, because it just looked really bad. But you still get to see the show. Um, So I think it's a slightly trickier situation where the the better the bootlegs are, the more of a problem they create for the actual production. Um, I do genuinely think that more productions should consider... Uh, having their shows properly recorded. Um, not just because, oh, there's, a, there's competition from bootlegs and people will watch the bootleg and will not come to your show. Uh, I think there are much more important reasons such as, well, maybe we can now start paying the actors more because we can show the whole thing to a million more people and we don't have to pay for the room while we're watching it. Um, so I kind of okay let let me put it this way if bootlegs make producers nervous then maybe that that will make them actually look into getting their shows recorded and maybe it will make them uh, pay more attention to quality so what, Mm -hmm. what can we do with the show that you can never do with a bootleg well, we can have multiple cameras. I mean, in theory, you could have five people recording on their phones and you could do multi-cam of that, but I doubt that would happen, at least not very frequently. Uh, so yeah. I, we have I, the sound I, issue and editing. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, let's bring on the bootlegs because competition is good. Very interesting. Uh, what musicals do you wish had been filmed? I actually do have an an answer. I, I was worried I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Anyone Can Whistle, which is running out of the Savark Playhouse right now, and I don't know if I'll have time to make it. They might actually have run out of tickets by now, but it's it's on for another few days, and I've just been looking at my calendar, and it's like, I, I can't make it. I totally second that one, because I love that show so much, and I've heard nothing but good things. I love the creative team. Yes, I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, what would you like to see filmed in the future? Or I'm actually, I'm going to change this question for mm-hmm. you. What would you like to work on in the future? Oh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I do like that question more. Um, okay, so this is actually a show that I will probably watch on stage because that's on for another, I think, two months or so. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Because I've, I've heard mm-hmm. nothing but good things about it. Uh, and it would be nice to kind of film a slightly bigger show. So, yeah. That, Producers that of Bonnie and Clyde, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my email Hill address Hill. will be somewhere in the description. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of, where can we find you online? Uh, 
Twitter, I guess, is best. I I don't update my Instagram often enough. I probably should do that. I'm very bad at marketing. I've got a list <laughs> of about 100 emails that I'm planning to send in the next few days. But other than that, I'm really bad at marketing and updating things. Well, I will have links to all of your socials, regardless, in the in the show notes. And thank you. Um, Bartek, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. I think we could talk for another <laughs> several days, weeks, months about all of the, the technical ins and outs of filming theater. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. With thanks to our wonderful patrons, Josh Brandon, Gerilyn Brewer, Belinda Broido, Elliot Charles, Gillian Dos Santos, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Rusty Fox, David Jones, James T. Lane, Heather Madrone, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Amy Penn, Gerald Piper, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Joe Telliston, and Beck Twist for financially supporting the site. FilmedLiveMusicals.com is the most comprehensive list of film stage musicals. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you would like early access to this very podcast, early access to site content, the full weekly newsletter with info on upcoming streams, and exclusive access to the streaming calendar, become a Filmed Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 a month. And if you're outside the US, you can sign up in your local currency. Visit filmedlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review in your podcast app. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thanks for listening.